Okay, class. Uh, this is my second time to give this lecture today because I forgot to push the record button at the first session this morning. So this one may be a little quicker, but uh, uh, we got to get this recorded for all of those who did not attend this morning. So with that, uh, we're going to run over this example problem again. This is one that uh, I think I had done maybe previously, but this is this is pretty important stuff. This is where the rubber meets the road. And so we want to uh, go through this. <clears throat> okay, so what we see here is we have a space that someone has calculated loads on, i.e. say with the carrier program we do. And the numbers they came up with were 60,000 BTUs per hour total and 42 BTUs per hour sensible. And the difference, the 18, uh, be a thousand BTUs an hour difference would be latent load. And I wanted to show quickly the carrier program here just to kind of uh, emphasize what we had learned to do uh, previously. So let me get this open real quick. And okay. And yes. And we'll pick systems and I'm going to pick core system. So, you know, at this point, we have defined the uh, walls, the windows, the roof, all the structure. We have input the spaces, which has lighting and people and uh, internal loads, computers, that sort of thing. Uh, and now we have defined an air system. And now we want to size the air system. So this is where you would be, this is where you would get those loads from. So if we pick core system and pick uh, view design results, things should run, ask for some reports, put the site chart in there and bingo. Pretty quick here, there you go. And we can make these a little bit bigger. And so right here on the first page, you see that the total core load, as far as equipment sizing, is 149 tons, which is pretty big. Probably wouldn't be one piece of equipment, but you know we're just kind of playing around here a little bit. Uh, and we see the total core load, almost 1.8 million. These are thousands of BTUs per hour. So you got to move the decimal point three places. So it's about almost 1.8 million total at about 1.327 million uh, sensible with the difference being um, the latent and lots of other information on here that I think you've looked at these sheets before. Uh, here is really where the rubber meets the road on this stuff. Um, it's the, this is, there would be the zone loads I break down uh, for the components. We've got roof, We've got floor, well, no, we don't have floor transmission. Um, we have overhead lighting. We have uh, electric equipment. We have people, sensible and latent, and we have infiltration. So those are the loads that we have input in this model. Uh, we could go back and we could, well, this is an interior space. So typically we would have uh, window solar loads, but because it's all interior, we don't. Uh, et cetera. So we add all this up and we get the zone loads. And so you can see this is, these are the zone loads that are for the space. Okay. And that's what we are using that 60,000 and that what 42,000 um, in the example problem. So we would take those numbers right from here. Uh, the equipment also sees ventilation load. It sees uh, supply, some fan heat. For the supply fan and it, I've, I've got some duct uh, heat gain in here as well. So these zone loads get increased by these other loads that are really outside the zone, but the unit sees them. And so these then are the total sensible and latent load. So that's our sensible. You add these together and you get total and that's close to that 1.8 million BTUs an hour. Um, if we wanted to, um, I'm looking for my, there's my calculator. If we wanted to calculate that the, the zone or the space sensible heat load, what we can do is we can uh, work with these numbers right here. So we've got one 
zero uh, nine four point two one four plus one fifty three point three seven six. So the total is um, twelve hundred and forty seven say point six um, thousand BTUs per hour. So that's the total. And if I take the sensible one oh nine four point two one four divided by recall one. So that um, sensible heat factor for this uh, zone or space would be 0.88. And but I just wanted you to see where that comes from. And if you come down here to the end, I told it to draw a psych chart, all the processes. And so you can look on here, say three is uh, what we're coming off the cooling coil. Four is after uh, the supply fan. So we've got the fan heat in there. And then five is uh, duct heat gain before we get to the space. This would be the condition line. And then six and seven are room air and return duct outlet <clears throat> as well. And then this is the outside air condition. And we mix from, I think, seven and one to get to two. And then from two to three is where we go across our coil in this. And well, this is uh, pretty directly analogous to this little example problem, except we don't put in all of these details here in here. OK, that's pretty good. So let's get out of this. OK. So here's our system. The space is maintained at 78 and 65. Um, we take some return air out here. We're going to exhaust some of it, and we're going to return some of it. Um, from three to four, we could put in duct heat gain if we wanted to. And then from four to four prime, if we had a return fan, we could put in some fan heat as well. We've got. Um, outside air at the rate of 500 cubic feet per minute coming in uh, to our unit here. Its condition is 90 and 55% relative humidity. Uh, we do mixing at this little circle from return air and outside air. We get our mixed air condition at one. That goes across the cooling and dehumidifying unit. <clears throat> and then we go across the supply fan and then the supply air goes into the space to satisfy the load. <clears throat> okay, so as we start this problem, first thing we're going to do is calculate the sensible heat factor. So that's 42,000 divided by 60 is 0.7. Let's see, where's the, here's the psych chart. Uh, so we're going to come in over here at uh, 0.7 would be this slope. And then we also, we put a dot for the space condition which is what, 78 and 65 dry bulb, wet bulb. So we put that dot, we take this slope at 0.7 and we draw a line for cooling. We draw it to the left for that slope and you can just draw it all the way off the, off the page if you want to. Uh, so, and that is the space condition line. Uh, in air at any point on that line that has the right uh, dryness and coolness to satisfy our loads with a sensible heat uh, ratio of 0.7, okay? I would note that um, the closer 0.2 is to 0.3, the more mass flow or the more CFM we're gonna have to supply. The further these points get away, the enthalpy difference is bigger and it will take less mass flow or volume flow to satisfy the load, okay? And so, once we have done this, we, we would want to uh, read these enthalpies, I1, I'm sorry, I3 right here, and I2 right here. And then we would do the uh, energy balance on the space. So we would say we got mass flow rate of dry air at two times enthalpy at two coming in, uh, plus the 60,000 BTUs an hour is coming into the space. And then the only thing we have leaving is the return air. And that's the mass flow rate at three times the enthalpy at three. And for steady state, these two mass flows are gonna be the same. 
So that really simplifies the uh, energy balance, which we see here. Uh, we're gonna call M dot A3 and M dot A2 by the same name, we'll call it M dot A2. And then we just factor and rearrange. And excuse me, we could solve for M dot A2 as the 60,000 BTUs an hour, the total load divided by the enthalpy difference. Uh, the author picked the enthalpies off the chart and got 30 BTUs per pound of dry air for I3 and 23 for I2. And so when we put all that in, we get uh, 8,570 uh, pounds mass per hour of dry air is what it's gonna to take to satisfy our uh, 60,000 BTU an hour load. Okay, uh, we always wanna calculate uh, volume flow. And so that's gonna take the specific volume and it's the volume flow of supply air. So we have to go to location two, which is right here. That's our supply air. So we would read the specific volume for two. And your author has done that for you. And he says it's 3.21. So you can get a site chart out and check all this. It wouldn't be a bad idea to draw this thing up <clears throat> and go through it. Okay, so on to the, um, well, okay, so we, we have our CFM of supply air. So now we wanna do the mixing where we're gonna mix return air, uh, M dot A4 and outside air M dot uh, A0. And so we know a, a volume flow rate of outside air is 500 CFM. So we need to uh, determine that mass flow rate. <clears throat> So again, for the outside air, it's up here at zero. So we would come up here and read a, a specific volume from the chart. And in this case, we're getting 14.23, what the author has read. And so this is cubic feet per minute times 60 minutes per hour gets cubic feet per hour. And then the 14.23 converts from cubic feet to pound mass. And so we got 2110 pound mass per hour. And so then um, we know the, the total uh, supply airflow into the space uh, for conditioning is 8570. So the return air is the difference uh, from the supply air to the outside air. So we subtract that off and we get uh, 6480 uh, pounds mass per hour. Uh, oh, excuse me getting late in the day here. Um, and so then we want to do the mixing problem. So if we take the mass flow rate of the outside air, which is the 2110, and divide by the total supply mass airflow, 8570, we get a little less than 25% of the distance uh, on the line connecting those two states, which uh, the overall line is this three zero, okay? So if we go up here, there is line three zero. And if we were all outside of air, we would be on zero. If we were no outside air, we would be over here on three. And so if we're 25% outside of the total, We'll go measure this line length and take 25% of it and lay that off from three back toward back and put a dot at one where that is. It doesn't look like you did it quite to scale, but you know, relatively close, I guess. But anyway, so that's how we determine, oh, excuse me, got these ones. Uh, our mixed air condition at one, mixing return air from three and the outside air at two. And then uh, this is one, let's see, where's my diagram, it's here. So one then goes across the cooling dehumidifying equipment to really to two because we're leaving out uh, the supply fan heat in a duct game. So it's the same mass flow all the way through there.
Okay, so with state one located, um, the author has read it at 81 uh, dry bulb and 68 wet bulb. So then we uh, draw the coral line connecting stage one and two. Uh, and we can write the energy balance for the coil. So we're going from one, which is the mixed air condition, to two. And notice we also have enthalpies at one, two, and three now. So we, we should know the enthalpies. The uh, energy balance on the space. <clears throat> so we've got the mixed air uh, coming in. So the mass flow rate of dry air at one times the enthalpy at one is equal to the heat removed by the cooling coil, that's total, uh, plus the mass flow rate of dry air at two times the enthalpy at two, and these two mass flow rates are the same. So that allows us to write this equation. And then when we plug numbers in, we can um, calculate the uh, load on the cooling coil to be uh, 80,560 BTUs per hour, which if you divide by 12,000 is 6.7 tons. So we were five tons in the space. So we picked up 1.7 tons of load for uh, ventilation air and it would be fan heat, but we didn't put fan heat in this uh, problem. Okay, so let's go back to the psych chart real quick. So now that we have this coil line, we can take it back to the protractor and draw that same slope down through here. And this will give us the uh, sensible heat factor for the cooling coil. And I believe he reads that at point 0.6 in the problem. But so we're taking that slope and we're taking it down here and reading point 0.6. And when we do that, then we see that six tenths of this total load is the sensible and the rest is the latent. Okay, so next, uh, let's see, we're going to roll over to the old yellow lecture notes and talk about um, bypass factor. And let's see, um, this is a little bit of a continuation of that last problem. And what it's looking at is, let's see, do we have it? Yeah, right here. Uh, this was the diagram. And if we wanted to include uh, a duct heat gain, say from three to four, uh, we certainly could. And if we wanted to include, say, a return air fan from four to four prime. So what this site chart does is it uh, is modified a little bit to include those uh, characteristics. And so if we can recall here, three is the space, the condition in the space, and two was our supply air condition into the space in order to uh, take care of the latent and sensible loads. Um, and so let's just start here. So this is where three is where the air would uh, leave the space right here, and then it's gonna get heated up some uh, by some uh, heat gain to the ducts uh, as they, they're they usually routed above the drop ceiling and it's not conditioned up there. So it'll be a little bit warmer. And so uh, in actuality, we'll probably pick up a degree or two of temperature before we get back to the return fan and the mixing section. And then uh, we go across the fan, which I had a little bit of additional energy. And so this is how we show this. So this is the three is the space condition. So four is the condition that we actually get back to the return fan. And we see it's just a small sensible heat addition. 
So we just add at a constant, we're not changing moisture, so we don't go up or down on the site chart. We just go, um, an increase in temperature will be to the right on the site chart. So that gets us to four. Then we go across the fan, and that's another small sensible heat addition, which gets us to four prime. So then the mixing takes place from four prime with the outside air. Um, we have more return air, so this point one is closer to four prime than it is to zero. But at any way, we do the mixing problem, and that locates uh, the mixed air condition state one. And then when we go across the cooling coil, because we're going to take into consideration the uh, supply fan, which is going to be a, another sensible heat addition. So we have to modify uh, the condition coming off of the coil so that when uh, we pick up the uh, fan heat that it gets us right back to uh, point two, which is the supply air condition that is on the condition line. So you have some additional factors that you have to put in here. And so again, back to the cycle, mixed air condition one, and then we actually have to go to uh, condition one prime, and then we do sensible heating over to two, and then uh, we still have the same situation going on in the space we did before. So it changes the uh, points on the site chart around the cycle a little bit to include those issues. Okay, and you can read these notes in here. This is where I talk about uh, like one prime, one prime to two, heat added by supply fan, et cetera. So you can, if you don't remember what that is, you can just review the notes here. Okay, the next point we're gonna move on to is define uh, bypass factor and bypass factor approach uh, <clears throat> as it's discussed in uh, the textbook. Um, so this is my hand rendition of the site chart. It doesn't look too bad. Um, so the, the simplistic one where we're not putting in the fan heat or the duct heat gain. So three, this is our space condition, uh, which we mix. That's also the return air. And so, you know, this is our mixing with outside air to one. We go, and so this is the coil line. One to two is the core line, two to three is the space condition line. Well, so for this bypassor, bypass factor discussion, what we do, we take the core line and we extend it until it hits the 100% relative humidity uh, line or the saturation line, okay? And then we're, we call that point D, okay? And there is some temperature at D, you can come down, whatever, and you could read it. Uh, we do an example here in a minute. I think that is 46 degrees is the number that they pick, but you know, it's what, where you draw it out on the site chart and wherever it hits that uh, saturation line, you just read the dry bulb temperature down here. Okay. Uh, let's see. And that point D is defined as the apparatus dew point temperature of the cooling core. So the core. Okay. So the concept here, kind of behind this, is that some of the air passing through the cooling coil is cooled to the coil temp. And it, it's kind of like we're dividing the supply air into two categories. Now, this is not how it really happens, but this is the concept. So we, we say some portion of the air is cooled all the way to the apparatus dew point because of the spacing between fins and all some air goes through and it doesn't get cooled at all. Now, in reality, you know, it's just, it's kind of a smooth transition between air that gets really cold and air that doesn't get very cold at all. We actually go through a real coil, but anyway, this is the concept behind the bypass factor approach. So then we have two quantities of air, one at D and one at one, which wasn't scathed by going through the coil. And then they mix, you know, as they come out of the coil and you wind up at point two. Okay, so that's kind of just breaks it down into uh, hypothetically a bunch of cold air over here, a bunch of air that's not conditioned. They mix along the mixing line and we wind up at two, which is our coil discharge temperature. 
Okay. And the last comment here, that's the coral produces unsaturated air at a higher temperature than the coral temperature or the apparatus dew point, right? Because you can't get, I mean, if this is your effective coral temperature, you can't get all of the air that cold. Some of it gets that cold, but certainly not all of it. And then it kind of mixes and you wind up up here at two. Okay, so if you ex examine that mixing line, uh, one to D, then uh, the segment two to D represents the mass uh, bypassing. Okay, so you see, we don't have as much bypassing as we do as being cool, because uh, remember, this is like the inverse lever rule. The longer uh, two to D is, the more air uh, that's bypassing, and the longer uh, one to two is, the more air that's being cooled to the apparatus dew point. And that's what this second. So one to two represents the mass being cool. Okay, then <clears throat> bypass fraction uh, B is defined as the enthalpy at two. That's a two, not a very good one, but it's two. Enthalpy at two minus the enthalpy at D. So enthalpy at two minus the enthalpy at D. This over here on. Uh, <clears throat> indicating the amount that's uh, bypassed divided by the enthalpy at one minus the, uh, in, and that's supposed to, that looks like a T, that's supposed to be enthalpy uh, <clears throat> at D, okay, which is the entire line length. So it's this enthalpy different divided by the total, okay. And that would indicate the fraction that's being bypassed. Well, if we write this as CP delta T, uh, CP is, is approximately the same. So we're going to cancel that out. So you can translate it into temperatures. And that's supposed to be an I right there. It looks like a T, sorry. Uh, and so then that defines this bypass factor as T2 minus TD divided by T1 minus TD. So that's kind of the definition of B. Okay, so it's T2 minus TD over T1 minus TD. <clears throat> well, okay, you can do a little algebra on it. And just for the heck, and you'll see where this comes in in a minute. So one minus B, well, this is one, right? Anything over itself, minus the bypass factor. And then you can uh, combine like terms. I have the same denominator, combine like terms. And so one minus B is T1 minus T2 over T1 minus TD. And if you go back and you, you can write an expression for the uh, sensible heating or cooling in this case, uh, and it's the mass flow rate of the air times CP times T1 minus T2. And if you look, so here's T1, here's T2. And so you just come down on those. And, you know, sensible heat is uh, mass flow rate times CP times delta T. And so, you know, you can, you can write that. Okay. But if you just look mathematically, you can also write this as CP times T1 minus TD times 1 minus B. If you substitute in this definition for one minus B, then uh, this term in the denominator gets canceled by this and it leaves T1 minus T2, which is the same as you have over here. So, you know, I don't know if that's very exciting, but anyway, uh, that's uh, what you can show. And then if you come back over here, there's another example where we do that for this problem three nine that we just went through. So he pulls the uh, apparatus dew point at 46, <clears throat> just plugs in the definitions. And so this is B one minus B and then he plugs it in to M dot CP. Of course, this is a complex CP because it has the moisture included. That's why it's 0.245 <clears throat> times the dry bulb temperature difference times the bypass. And this is, it doesn't come out exactly but it comes out pretty close to the results that he had before. 
And so that just shows how you can use. And then if you want latent load, uh, we had calculated the total load minus sensible, and that, that would be latent. And he says it's 12% off. Okay. So uh, not great, but uh, it's another approach. Okay, we're on to our last uh, example problem for uh, today's lecture. And uh, I can't emphasize too much that you guys need to study these things and really understand. If you will understand each step in this, then you will start to uh, understand the design process and what engineers have to go through. Uh, a lot of times this is, gets automated with some of the computer software, but you need to be able to do this by hand, step by step, to just basically understand what's going on. <clears throat> okay, so this is going to be a heating and humidification problem. The space is to be maintained at 75 Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity. Heat losses from the space are 225,000 BTUs per hour sensible and 56, uh, 250 BTUs per hour latent. Again, that came from running the loads program, like the carrier half or train trace or whatever program the firm that you might be working with is uh, using. <clears throat> uh, okay, the latent heat transfer is due to the infiltration of cold, dry air. Okay, and I want to illustrate this for a second to make sure that... Uh, you understand this. So let's go up. I think I have a site chart up here. I do. And I'm going to rotate it one time as I do. And we're going to blow it up a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. Let's see, maybe one more. There we go. That's pretty good. <clears throat> okay. And so the coldest air we have on this is um, 32. There's 35. That's 32 over here. And so let's say that it's 32 degrees outside. <clears throat> and let's say that the air is saturated. Maybe we're having a snowstorm or a snow slash rainstorm, whatever. <clears throat> and so at 100% relative humidity, <clears throat> that air would be 32 and on the saturation line. And of course, these are our relative humidity amounts and the 100% saturation is up here. And so we come down in 32. So we're right about here. <clears throat> and that's the moisture content of the air. <clears throat> so what I want you to notice is the air saturated. It's 100% relative humidity, but we're still pretty low on the moisture scale. If you come across and read that, it's 0 0.004 pounds mass of uh, H2O vapor per pound of dry air and it's saturated, okay? So it's holding all it can hold. But let's say some of that air leaks into our space <clears throat> that we're maintaining at 75 degrees. And so what's that process line look like? Well, we're gonna come, come flying across here at constant moisture level, and there's 75, bingo. So what's the relative humidity at 75? Oh, my goodness, it's about 22%. So all of a sudden, in heating this up from 32 to 75, at constant moisture, the relative humidity has gone down to 22%. To and, and remember, relative humidity is the amount of moisture in the air divided by the amount of moisture the air can hold. And at 75, obviously, the air can hold a lot more moisture than at 32. Well, just to illustrate this further, so let's come across and let's heat it up to 120. Now, obviously, we're not going to be doing that with an HVAC system in the space that we're living in. But just to make the point, what's the relative humidity over here at 120? Well, gosh there's 10% and we're roughly about half of that. So it's on the order of 5%. And it's the same moisture level in the air. It's just the, as the temperature increases, the air can hold so much more moisture. And that's an important concept in psychometrics and HVAC and just, you know, 
you're doing anything with more sterile processes. You need to, to realize that. So, and it points out that this relative humidity is not really a very good uh, engineering variable to work with because it doesn't really tell you very much. I mean, it tells you how much is there relative to how much can be there. Okay. All right, so let's see, let's go rotate it counterclockwise. And that should put me back and run instead, take this down a little bit, and let's go back down to our problem. We're down here pretty close to the bottom. Yeah, this is this is it. Okay. Okay, so anyway. <clears throat> um the latent heat transfer for this problem is due to the infiltration of cold, dry air. And so what happens that if a lot of air leaks in, it doesn't have much moisture. When it heats up, the relative humidity plummets and the space becomes uncomfortable. And if you sit in a space that's too dry, you lose moisture from your skin, it can potentially have cracking or itching and that sort of thing. So that's why we might want to add a humidifier to keep that moisture level up for comfort conditions. Okay, the outdoor air required is 1000 CFM and it's at 35 degrees Fahrenheit and 80% relative humidity. Uh, determine the quantity of air supplied at 120 Fahrenheit and uh, state and uh, the state of the supply air size the furnace or heating coil and the humidifier characteristics usually that's uh, how much how much water we have to inject in the space okay so pretty typical problem uh, heating and humidification okay so first thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate our sensible heat factor as we uh, that's usually when you go through these problems that's the first thing you're going to want to do <clears throat> given your loads and so we see it is 0.8. Okay, so then we're going to start constructing the psych chart for the problem. So we would come over here on the protractor and we would put a dot down here at 0.8 on the, on the uh, I think that's the inner scale. <clears throat> and then you draw a line from the, uh, the center of the protractor over here out through that 0.8 line, which is a nice straight line. Uh, okay, so you've got the slope of that, and then we would put this 0.3, which is the space condition, which would be our uh, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 50% relative humidity. We just put a dot there, and then we take this slope, <clears throat> and we transfer it down, and we draw a straight line uh, from 0.3 out to the right at that slope, and we can go ahead and draw it. You can draw it all the way off the chart if you want to. Okay, and then, so that would be the space condition line. So air uh, supplied at any point on that line would satisfy our loads. Uh, it has the right degree of moisture addition and sensible heating in order to be able to satisfy both the sensible and latent loads on the space. Okay, so how are we going to figure out where we are on that line? Well, it's we're told in the problem it's 120 degrees, so this T2 would be 120, which on a standard psych chart is all, all the way over here on this edge, but anyway, that doesn't matter. So we come up at 120, and where that 120 intersects the space condition line, we put a dot, and that becomes 0.2. So that's our supply air condition into the space. Okay, now from this point, <clears throat> there's a couple ways that we can work the problem to continue on the psych chart. What he's done here is uh, he's gone ahead and done the mixing problem. Well, we have to do the mixing problem. So this is our outside air condition, and this is our return air condition because we're assuming we're not allowing for any duct heat gain or anything like that. So we're saying that the the condition at three is the condition at four, and that gets mixed with outside air. It gives us uh, the condition at one. So this is the result of the mixing. And then he's gonna do the heating and humidification 
in one fail swoop, in one uh, overall process. And so he's drawn a straight line from one to two, and that represents the heating and humidification. Now, <clears throat> if you recall, uh, let's go up here and back when we were well, not that far. Okay. And so this was heating and humidification. <clears throat> and so this was, this is his overall process line for both. And then if you want to divide it into the sensible and the latent or the uh, furnace and the humidifier, you can draw a straight line out here, uh, which would be at constant moisture content. And then if you can find, you, you have to, to know what you're going to humidify with, and you have to look up that enthalpy out here for adiabatic humidification, wherever it is. And then you draw a line with that slope uh, down through here and where that mix, is, where, where these two lines cross, that's point A. That's the end of the furnace and the start of the humidifier. Okay, so what you're going to find though is if you're humidifying with, say, liquid water, that enthalpy is so small, you wind up coming out in this direction. And when you try to draw this line, it draws you off of the site chart. <laughs> and so, you can't really do it unless you get a high temperature psych chart. But if you have a high temperature psych chart, then you can certainly go ahead and do this, okay? Uh, if you're humidifying with steam, you get, it's much more energetic and we get a slope kind of like this one, in which case then we can draw this line down here, get the slope, transfer it down here and draw the humidifier line or the humidification line from the ending point backwards and where it crosses the sensible heat line is point A, and that's the end of the furnace and the start of the humidifier. So yeah, as we go in this problem, we come on down and we find out that, um, let's see, I'm not down, here it is, that he's going to humidify, <clears throat> where does he talk about it down in here someplace? He's humidifying with water. And so, well, we'll come to it. Well, I don't, I don't know where it is in the verbiage, but we'll come to it here in just a minute. Let me see, does it say? It doesn't say here. It does further down in the problem. But anyway, we'll come to it. Okay, so we have laid out our uh, space condition and we've drawn this line for the, uh, that's the condition line, and we indicated 120 degrees on it. That's about as far as we are really into the problem solution. Okay, so we did that. So now the next thing is to do an energy balance on the space. And so you just put a little control volume around the space and write the first law for it. Well, what do you got? We got our supply air coming in over here. So that's uh, M dot A2 times the enthalpy at two coming in. And then uh, leaving, so we put the other stuff on the other side of the equation. So we're, we're losing the energy and we're losing the moisture from the space, uh, basically because of the dry air coming in, drying it out. And so we put the Q dot over here on this side, that's the combined load, that's the sum, I think it's 181,250 is this plus this. <clears throat> is that right? Yeah, I think that is right, okay. Uh, and then we have our return air coming up the top and it's the mass flow rate of air at three times the enthalpy at three. And then we can also notice that <clears throat> the mass flow rates are the same at two and three. So he drops the M dot A3 uh, nomenclature and just goes to M dot A2 for both of them since it's the same value. We rearrange this equation and solve for Q. Uh, well, he writes it for Q, and then, but then he solves it for the mass flow rate. So you divide through by the enthalpy difference. And there's our 181,250 total uh, load divided by the enthalpy at two, which is coming, uh, that's the supply air. He's read that at 42 off of the chart. And 
the uh, return air enthalpy is 28.2. So those are the enthalpies here and here. And he just plugs those numbers in. It allows us to find <clears throat> the mass flow rate of 20,400 pounds mass of dry air per hour. Then we go up to this same point here and get the specific volume because we want to know the CFM of supply air. So this is the condition that we want the specific volume uh, evaluated at. And so he does that and he pulls that off of the chart at 14.89. And then, so this is what pounds mass per hour divided by 60 is pounds mass per minute times specific volume um, converts to uh, cubic feet per minute. And so we got 50, 60 cubic feet per minute is the uh, supplier flow rate that we would specify for this. Okay, so now we wanna do the mixing problem. <clears throat> so of this uh, return air that comes out of the space, part of it gets thrown away and the rest of it goes back and mixes with the outside air. And then that combined total is the 20,400 uh, pounds per hour. So now we're have, going to have to do the mixing problem. Uh, and so we have to figure out what the mass flow rate of outside air is. <clears throat> we're given 1,000 cubic feet per minute. <clears throat> and so he's going to go and evaluate the specific volume <clears throat> over here at zero in order to determine the mass flow rate from that volume flow rate. So we get the, the specific volume over here at zero and uh, for the outside air. And he, he's read that at 12.53. So then we have our thousand cubic feet per minute times 60 is cubic feet per hour divided by specific volume gives 4790 pounds mass per hour. And that's the outside air portion. So then the difference between the total supply air mass flow and the portion that is outside is the return air. So we subtract it off. And so we get 15,600 pounds mass dry air per hour for the return airflow, which is uh, from three and we throw away the rest of it. And we get that amount over here that mixes to produce the mixed air condition at one that goes into the furnace. Okay. Okay, so here's the uh, mixing problem. So if we take the mass flow rate of the outside air, that's 4790 divided by the total supply air flow rate, we get about not quite 25%, 23.5%. And so what that says is the if you take the length of the overall line 3-1, uh, we can move 23.5% in order to locate state one. Okay. So here's the overall line, zero to three or three to zero, however. And then, so you have to figure out, okay, which point am I gonna be closer to? And this doesn't look like he drew it to scale very well. Okay, but realize that we have more return than we have outside. So we've got to be down on this part of the curve. So you would measure this line segment length and calculate 23 and a half percent of it and move that distance down the line from three. And when you got to that point, you would locate one. Well, the real point looks like it's in here someplace and he's got it drawn out here, but that's so he doesn't, the figure is going to collapse on itself if he really draws it to scale. And so he stretches this out a little bit so you can see what's going on, even though it's not, doesn't look quite right. But anyway, that's how we determine uh, point one. It's 23 and a half percent of the line length down through here. Or you can go back and use the equations. And, and uh, if you use the equations, you, you can calculate this W1 and then just come across and wherever it, uh, intersects the line between three and, and zero would locate state one. That, I mean, the, the graphical procedure is fine for these problems. Okay, so that gets us down at the bottom. And so he says this state one 
uh, the mixed air condition is 66 uh, uh, degrees Fahrenheit dry bulb and 57 wet bulb. Uh, okay, and then, uh, so then he's gonna connect between state one and state two, and that line represents the heating and humidification. And so then we're gonna do an energy balance around the furnace and humidifier, and then we'll write the first law uh, based on that energy balance. Okay. okay. And so <clears throat> this is what he gets <clears throat> for the energy balance uh, <clears throat> coming in to the furnace, we've got M dot A1 times enthalpy at one, and the furnace is putting uh, sensible heat into that. So that's the Q dot H, and we're also injecting uh, water. And so that's the M dot W, and the I sub W is the enthalpy of the water. And then the only thing that you're leaving is out of the humidifier, we're coming out here so we've got the mass flow rate at two times the enthalpy at two. And we happen to recall that that's 120 degrees. But so that's the energy balance on the furnace slash humidifier equipment. Okay. Now, if you think about the uh, mass balance on the water, well, the water coming in is the mass flow rate of dry air times W1. So there is some moisture in that mixed air coming into the furnace. We're gonna inject M dot uh, uh, W, that's the flow rate of water that's coming out of the humidifier into the airstream. And all of that must leave uh, at the exit of the humidifier, which is M dot A2 times W2, uh, the humidity ratio. And of course, M dot A1 and M dot A2 are the same. So he just drops the M dot A2 notation and goes with M dot A1, factors that out. And so then you just write this equation by a little uh, rearrangement uh, and factoring. And then uh, this can be substituted back in for M dot W here. And so, this becomes the uh, energy balance solved for the capacity of the furnace. So we went ahead and substitute, made this substitution for M dot W and then solved this for uh, Q dot H. So this is the uh, sensible capacity uh, that's required of the furnace. Uh, okay, so here, assume ordinary tap water at 55 is used in the humidifier. Okay, so when you look that up, 55 degree saturated liquid water, you get an enthalpy of 23.08. Well, so that what's going to happen if you try to do this, finding that point A, you're going to find that that slope goes like this. And so when you draw from this point, you quickly get off of the psych chart. So if you have a high temperature psych chart, you could do it that way. Otherwise, you just need to use the equation. That's why you know, we developed it here. Okay, so now we're gonna plug in and find out what the uh, uh, sensible heating uh, requirement for the furnace is. So we just plug in our numbers and he does, he factors out what the uh, M dot A1, so he pulls that out. So that's the 20,000. And so the first term is just, uh, I2, that's the uh, supply air, and I1 is the mixed air condition into the furnace, which he's looked up at 24.6. And then so we've got minus W2 minus W1 times IW. And so that's what we've got here. That's the humidity ratio at two, humidity ratio at one times IW. And so when we do that math and punch it out on the calculator, we get 353,000 BTUs an hour. So that's probably gonna be a 400,000. 400,000, a pretty common number in the heating capacity on the, the, this type of furnace. So that's probably gonna be a 400,000 BTU an hour furnace and you just got a little extra capacity. 
Um, and then for the amount of water supplied by the humidifier, that's the mass flow rate of the dry air times the difference in humidity ratio. This is what's leaving, this is what's coming in. The difference is what had to be supplied by the humidifier. And so when we put those numbers in, we get uh, uh, 79.6 pounds mass an hour, which is 1.33 pounds mass a minute. Uh, and he has, so this is a good note. I like this note. Um, it's usually necessary to use a preheat coil to heat outdoor air to a temperature above the dew point uh, of that return air in the equipment room so that you don't get condensation liquid water in the air ducts where that mixing occurs. Um, so let me see now, I do have this figure up here someplace. So what they do, he's got, I gotta get right out of the example problems here. This is it right here. So this is the modified system showing the addition of a preheat coil. And so, you know, you just do some sensible heating on the outside air to boost its temperature before you do the mixing. Um, so that you, you, you don't have to worry about any liquid uh, condensing out of this moist air coming back in the space. Now on the psych chart, you know, what we had before, we were just starting at zero and mixing with three. And now we have this extra little process line. We do sensible heating from zero to zero prime. And then we mix from zero prime uh, to three in order to determine uh, state one. And then uh, we go ahead and do uh, the, uh, the problem from there. Now it's interesting. This psych chart is showing the sensible furnace and the humidifier, but this is because this line is for steam. And this, thing, this line will have an enthalpy of about 1150 BTU. So when you come to the protractor, but with us, we were 23 and that, that line. So, so this, brought, this line for the humidifier for our problem would go over here off the chart and then we'd have to heat back. So yeah, depends what fluid it, it is. Uh, as to um, really if you can work it on the site chart or not. Let me see, I think, I think that's, yeah, that's it on uh, these problems. So we're getting close to the end of psychometrics here. I'll probably have a few more comments next time. So, okay, I'm gonna cap this up and hopefully get it posted to you. This is the second time I've gotten to give this lecture. I hope I got better the second time, you know, I don't know. But everybody have a great day. Back in touch soon. Bye.